Um, so we have Dr. Emily Brettel back uh, to talk about place-based education. A very practical thing about this session is your, um, for the 361 class, your last like big lesson plan assignment is a place-based one. So um, on a practical side, you're going to have to make a lesson plan based on this in a month. Um, kind of on a like bigger picture thing, um, to me, one of the things that happens a lot is we try to teach um, like our kids are anywhere, you know, and we try to teach be like, oh, we're going to teach the exact same science lesson that you could teach anywhere. Um, but that's not the way students really learn. Like students are always in an actual place. They're in actual communities. Your schools have things going on around them. Um, and everything we do teaches our students something about the value of the place we're at. So um, it's something that matters a lot to me, um, especially coming from a rural background. I like ways that we approach teaching that help tell kids that, hey, um, the community and your, the places you're in are important um, and worthwhile. Uh, and so this is, you know, you'll do a lesson plan, a place-based science lesson plan, but this is an idea that applies across subject areas um, and across grade levels and all sorts of different places. Um, so, and that's something I kind of hope that you're able to see is like, oh, yes, it's useful for science, but it's also useful a lot of other places too. Um, so Dr. Brettel, if you would like to, do you need to share anything or? Yeah, I'll share the screen just okay. it helps me stay focused, especially on a topic like this that I'm like super excited about. <laughs> so let's see if I can do it right the first time. There. Cool. Well, thanks for having me again. Um, I am super excited that Dr. Clay is incorporating this into your teaching and learning. Um, for those of you who are here, I'm glad that you get to listen in real time. For those of you who will be, you know, hopefully watching and tuning in later. Um, like he said, this is just such a practical and fun way of starting to um, incorporate place into your teaching, whether it's science teaching or across the whole board. Um, so you can hopefully tell by the triple exclamation point, this is what I'm really passionate about. Um, I would consider myself a scholar of place-based education. It's what I focus my doctoral work on. Um, and I particularly focus on a type of place-based education that I've um, coined and been using the phrase with teachers of ecological place-based education. I'll talk a little bit more about that and why that may or may not be redundant, um, but needless to say, this is a really exciting way of teaching. All right, so to get started, um, just so you're all clear, my whole aim here is again in this quick, you know, 30 minutes or so is to introduce you to place-based education as an approach to science education. That being said, this is definitely applicable to all of the work that you will do as classroom teachers and really applicable, especially in the interdisciplinary nature of an elementary. Uh, classroom. So we'll do a warm up, we'll do some definitions like we did last time so that we're on the same page, and then I will be throwing at you lots of examples and um, a few practices in there. Those of you who are, who are on here, please stop and ask questions. That goes for Dr. Clay as well. If you think I've glossed over something, I should go more deeply into something um, because I get, I get really excited about it, but I also don't know how much you know, to, to just stop and calm down, chill out. Cool, so um, for those of you who weren't here last time, just a quick introduction. I'm Dr. Brettel or Dr. B, um, as a lot of my students have <laughs> enjoyed calling me. Now, when we talk about place-based education, we cannot forget to talk about this idea of a sense of place. And a sense of place can be defined in so many ways. Um, I'll actually, I'll stop here and say, you know, Dr. Clay, how would you define sense of place? Because I know you've done a lot of work around this. If you were to succinctly say for yourself, this is what I think a sense of place is, what might that be? Um, 
to me, it's having a definite personal understanding of what the place around you, whether it's your community or like your habitat, like ecological environment, what it means to you and what your place in it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great way to define it. Um, and I'd say that most other definitions would be variations on that. Some people will, um, some, some scholars and ecological educators will emphasize more the ecology in the natural history side. Some people will get really excited about the actual civic engagement and kind of government side of it. Um, some people will more be thinking about the larger landscape or the geological history. There's lots of different ways that you can engage in place-based um, teaching and learning and lots of ways to define what, a, what your sense of place is. Um, I really love this definition or this idea that Rebecca Solnit, um, she's an author and activist, gives, which is that sense of place is the sixth sense. It's an internal compass and map made by memory and spatial perception together, right? So it's how we perceive a place as an actual space when we are in it, um, but also how we think about it, how we remember it, um, how we engage in that, um, even when we're not in that place. So for me in particular, um, I'm from the Midwest. Um, I grew up outside of Chicago um, in the suburbs, but very much in the cornfields as the suburbs were turning into the suburbs. Um, so I grew up running and playing in cornfields. Um, this view here is a very familiar one to me. Uh, I've spent a ton of time working on the prairies of the Midwest. And um, to me, this is, this is a really special place um, where the, the, both the tall grass and the short grass um, come together in different places and in different ways. That landscape of big horizons um, of really important animals, most of whom have been displaced. Um, these are things that have influenced who I am and how I teach and what I teach about. Um, I'm also where I live now, uh, near the Great Lakes, um, particularly the South Shore of Lake Michigan, has played a really big role in my thinking about especially environmental action um, because of the, the nature of this place and how it's been influenced over time by all the different people who have lived here, um, who have worked here, who have um, made their living off the land here in different ways. So um, I'm not sure and I'm going to bring it back to the, the live audience. Have any of you ever used or heard the Where I Am From poem by George Ella Lyon? I see, I see Dr. Clay is nodding. Um, can you still see this? Am I still sharing this page as well? Perfect. Never know when Zoom isn't working to my to my favor. So the original poem, um, it goes like this. It's where I am from. I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch, black, glistening, it tasted like beets. I am from the forsythia bush, the Dutch elm, whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. I am from fudge and eyeglasses, from Imogene and Alifair. I am from know-it-alls and pass-it-ons, from perk up and pipe down, from he restoreth my soul with a cotton ball lamb. In 10 verses, I can say myself. I am from Artemis and Billy's branch, fried corn and strong coffee. From the, gin, the finger my grandfather lost to the auger, the eye my father shut to keep his sight. Under my bed was a dress box spilling old pictures, a sift of lost faces to drift beneath my dreams. I am from those moments, snapped before I budded, leaf fall from the family tree. Now, I include that here um, because I have seen a lot of times, I've actually multiple times in my teaching career, have seen elementary school teachers incorporate that poem into the beginning of the school year. And what I have always thought is what an interesting way to join kind of your typical getting to know you activities as well as some poetry um, into helping students write 
from the beginning to develop a sense of place. Um, and so, you know, if I were to do that, for example, I might start with, I'm from the cornfields of the Midwest, the prairies and the Great Lakes. I'm from the smell of pine needles and manure, the taste of sweet corn in the summer and the crisp of apples in the fall and dot, 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 right? I could go on and I could go on. Um, and the whole reason I bring that up again is because this whole sense of place and developing that through teaching can be entered into from a lot of places. So let's do a little bit of a warm up for you all, because uh, this may be a somewhat new concept for you, but it's something I guarantee is um, that you've dealt with. So for this, you're going to need a paper and a pencil. And see a little bit of leaning over. I'll give you a moment. Morgan's walking through the airport. So Morgan, you're just going to have to use your imagination. No, with this. you need uh, to write it. You need to you need to write it right as soon as, you, as soon as you find your gate perhaps you can jot some things down um so i want you to think of your favorite place in the world uh, preferably one that you visited many times or at least that you have a very strong memory of okay so you know this isn't some place that you know you want to go perhaps this is some place that you really know and you know well um even if it's just from one visit um but that you really haven't have um, connected with. So very first thing, I just want you to make a few notes about it. Sketch it, write your favorite memory. Don't worry about complete sentences. Just sort of jot down some of the things about that place that you really love. Um, if you're somebody who likes to sketch, like I said, draw a picture, just a line sketch of something that um, strikes you about that place. All right, now we're gonna keep building on that. Um, and I gave you a taste of this uh, when I was sharing, you know, making that connection between the George Ella Lyon poem and then my own sense of place. But what I'd like you to do now is to list one or two things you associate with this place for each sense, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. This can be kind of a funny, a little bit awkward um, at times because we don't tend to distill the places that we love down to just the five senses. Um, but I really want you to try to do that. So what is one sight or two sights? What's a sound that you think of for this place? What is a smell that you associate with it? How about a touch, a feel, or a taste? Go ahead and I'll give you um, a minute or so and then I'll check in and see how everybody's doing because this can be, like I said, a, a little bit tough. And then as you're writing, think of one or two of these you might like to share with the, the live group right now. All right, so even if 
you're not 100% done or you feel like you could keep going with this for another you know, five or 10 minutes, go ahead and find a stopping point. And what, because we're a small group, I hope everybody's okay um, on muting yourself if you are able and maybe just sharing one or two of your senses of place. Um, so maybe tell us where your place is and one or two of the senses you associate with that. Let's see, and that's fine, Susie. I got the chat open and I can read out what you say there. Um, so can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, so I put Ponca, Arkansas. It's where my church camp is. And um, I said it's humid because Arkansas is insanely humid in the summer. <laughs> and um, a smell would be musty wood because you know, all the cabins are made out of just basically plywood. And because it's super humid, it's a little mildewy. So it's, there's a very distinct smell when you walk into the cabin. So those are my feelings. Thank you so much. Isn't it lovely how sometimes what might be an unappealing smell elsewhere can be like something that you really love. That's like me and the smell of like manure on a field. Okay. It's yeah. like, oh, that sounds like home. <laughs> yeah. All right, would anybody else like to share? Yeah, I can. Um, I, some of the senses I described was like a sweet and like a fresh type thing. Um, my place that I was describing is where my family's from in Tennessee. And so like I picked like those different things from when we visited there, it became my favorite place. And so like the humidity, lots of green and trees and hills and windy roads, but also like the senses that remind me of it is like delicious, sweet and fresh. Wonderful. That's great. That makes me think of, um, there was a I did this practice with a group of teachers once and a teacher lived in a place that had a smuckers factory. Um, <laughs> and so they, they said, actually, my smell is the smell of smuckers jelly being made, right? And then they said that anytime they ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, no matter where they were, it brought them home um, because of that. And let's see, Susie has added um, Grandpa's Pond in Alpena, Arkansas. The clay feel of mud between the toes, the taste of ripe berries. Awesome, wonderful. Uh, so again, we've just done a, a really short version of this. And the whole reason is both to enliven the senses and help us to understand and start recognizing that the places in which we live, the places that we visit, the places that we've grown up in and teach in, they shape us. And so why not let them help shape our curriculum as well? Let, why not say, what is really unique about this place and how can I incorporate that into um, my teaching? Because then students get to build that sense of place as well, instead of just having that generic, you know, oh, this curriculum could be taught anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world. Um, you can still teach that curriculum, but drawing on examples and experiences to help them connect can be incredibly meaningful. Um, feel free, this is definitely an exercise that's really fun to do with kids, um, helping them to connect with place. I've done it with students when working on civic action projects to help them kind of recognize what they love about their community or what they think are issues about their community. And this is such a nice place to dive in because almost everybody can connect with place through the senses. All right, so moving forward just with some very clear definitions of what place-based education is within the educational scholarship realm. So David Sobel, um, for a long time, has been one of the lead authors on place-based education, providing us with lots of useful resources around defining place-based education and pushing it forward um, as an approach to teaching and learning, both science teaching, but also in general. He defines place-based education as the process of using the local community environment as a starting point to teach all the things that we need to teach. And particularly, he focuses on developing public school teachers who really are you know, focusing on language arts and mathematics, social studies, science, um, but it can really be any subjects across. In my own doctoral work um, and in my own work as an educator, I've 
really wanted to start highlighting the ecological of the place based. And my reason for doing this is because I think that connecting to place is important. Um, for myself as a science teacher, I think that expanding that definition to very clearly um, help students and teachers start to understand ecological concepts, being able to recognize interdependent relationships, and also not always worrying about the content, <laughs> but also really focusing our, on developing that and nurturing love and delight for the world is just as important um, within place-based education. So you might hear me slip and say ecological place-based education. That's because that's the framework I tend to use, um, but it's just a kind of a sub branch of place-based education. So some of the starting points, if you are thinking about this for entering into place-based education, it could be the local community, right? So they're in the, the pink, if you see color. Um, so the local community can be a place, maybe you're somebody who's really interested in civic engagement or in the history of a place. Maybe you want to enter more through the nature and ecology, you're more focused on the actual science um, as, a, you know, as your role as a science teacher. Um, or maybe you are very focused on the standards and what your school needs you to teach or wants you to teach. And so you're going to start by choosing some standards and then seeing how you can incorporate the local place into that. Maybe you're somebody who really wants to get your students engaged in a local issue and actually taking action or learning to care for local spaces. That can be another great starting point. Obviously, that sweet spot is really going to be that center where all these pieces are coming together. Um, as elementary educators and even for middle years educators, that sweet spot is a little easier to incorporate into teaching and learning because you're often teaching through interdisciplinary methods. In high school, that can be sometimes a bit more difficult, though place-based education is almost always going to be interdisciplinary, even if you are only focusing on the science or only focusing on the um, the history or social science aspects. Now, if I were to distill down the aims of project, or I'm sorry, of place-based education, I'd say it's to help our students and teachers develop a sense of place to really create a curricula that is life-worthy, right? So that's helping students connect with um, their learning to their life. It's about developing ecological literacy, so understanding how the world works and our place within it. Um, and then engaging in the local community. Again, there's a lot, there's many more aims depending on who you are and what you really care about. Some people would say, oh no, it's about making sure that we take action for change. Um, everybody will emphasize different things, but these are kind of the distilled big pictures. Of course, it's really helpful to know what the benefits of place-based education are, if anybody is asking. And they're very similar if you're here for the arts-based um, presentation last week, it's really about making learning more meaningful, helping students to connect their skills to the real world. Um, a particular benefit of place-based education is that reducing a brain drain, and this is really important in rural areas, as I'm sure many of you might know, right, of people who are intelligent and creative and enthusiastic actually leaving because they feel like they need to go someplace else um, because they, they really don't know what or why they would want to stay in that place. So place-based education can actually help people connect to place and feel a sense, a deeper sense of belonging and commitment to the, to the places that they live in. It improves student engagement, improves ecological literacy, and then all, all of this leads to raised student achievement. If you want more information on those, I've included a couple links that you are more than welcome to dig into. Um, if you find this really interesting, you know, or if you just want to, to be able to make a, give a, an, an administrator a reason for why you're going to do this. Um, one thing I'll interrupt and throw in really quick. In Kansas, one of the new outcomes, KSD doesn't know how to, they're, they're going to measure this, so like setting that aside. One of the outcomes that is officially listed now is civic engagement. Um, so it's also one that like to an administrator, you can justify by saying like, hey, look, Kansans can, this policy says, this is one of the things we're gonna do. Um, so if it's a project or something in the community, that 
is an outcome that is listed in state policy. Um, wow. You That's won't get a lot of help from KSD on what that should look like. So this would be a great place for what it would look like. But that is definitely a way you can justify it. If they're like, well, why don't you just teach them the stuff they need to know and not bother with it? Like, well, according to the state, this is in the need to know list. That's awesome. And I, I came back on this slide because this picture of the students sitting here, this was actually a group of students I was working with in um, a very, very urban area of Denver. And we were working on some water quality and water management issues around flooding and that sort of stuff. So we we're actually collecting some data here and they were making some um, sketches and writing down ideas for like the sorts of people they would need to talk to and get engaged with as part of an actual civic engagement project. So thanks for bringing that. That's really cool. It's cool to see that stuff. Um, I feel like I need to put these in here when I'm giving presentations in this world virtual age, right? Like we're having to, we're, we're learning a lot right now. And the key things are that it's very important to plan ahead, to be patient, be super creative and stay safe as you're figuring out how to do these both normal ways of teaching and also if you're trying to incorporate new ways of teaching. Place-based education is necessarily place-based, but if you're planning to say to kids, you know, go out and interview somebody in the community, well, you might want to remind them to like wear a mask and socially distance and wash their hands and all those sorts of things that um, make for good social care as well. Um, as still being uh, engaged in your local community. So any questions before going through it? I'm going to be uh, pretty much dumping a whole bunch of examples on you <laughs> right now. All right, cool. So I want to remind you, uh, just like with the arts-based teaching and learning, with place-based education, it's very important to start where you are both literally and figuratively. So literally looking around the place in which you teach, the community, saying to yourself, okay, where are some of the, the things that, um, what are some of the things that I want to engage with? But it's also saying to yourself, what can I handle? Um, so not feeling like you have to take it all on at once or be an expert. I love this quote from Rachel Carson in which she, she's really addressing the adults wanting to guide the children. She says, I sincerely believe that for the child and for the adult seeking to guide them, it is not half so important to know as to feel. If facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and the impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. When you're trying out new ways of teaching, or if you are a new teacher, remember that you're gonna be learning a lot as you go, and the best thing to do is to start and learn along the way as opposed to saying oh no 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 i can't do that there's always some little thing you can do to get started so uh, this idea of starting small and going slow um, is written about extensively by sarah anderson in a book i'm blanking on the name um it's called bringing school to life and she, it's all about place-based education and she and I totally agree with her that when you're getting started with it, it can be very important to just sort of, you know, pick the little things that you can do. It might feel disjointed. It might be, you know, an outside um, adventure on site here. It might be an example from a local newspaper there. But in the end, um, it's better than absolutely doing nothing, in my opinion, if you want to get kids engaged with the local community, with the local ecology. Now, on the other end of this continuum, right, of you know, kind of starting small to going slow. On the very other end is the idea of teaching with the earth in mind. And this is an idea that comes from David Orr, who of course, he's trying to say our whole curriculum should be focused on teaching with the earth and the community in our places in mind. Now for many of us, that's not going to be possible. It's gonna be very hard um, to accomplish, but it is sort of that ideal. And here I've kind of, shown that you know that you've got all of those disparate pieces that are on the one end of the spectrum coming together into a more complete whole um, on the other end of the spectrum and of course it's that middle ground where a lot of us spend a lot of time balancing the things that we have to do that are required of us and the things that we really want to do or are learning to do better um, as we become the educators that we hope to be so again, just think of this continuum um, and moving along that in any direction at multiple times throughout your teaching career. 
So some of the opportunities for, for integrating um, place into science, I won't read these all out to you, but they can kind of range from the little things, just materials, examples, activities, to the really big things. So designing entire projects um, or collaborating with community partners. But again, that middle ground, right, of using local place or local examples as assessments, um, intentionally integrating the specific standards into place um, can really be sort of that sweet spot for a lot of teachers once they get going with place-based teaching and learning. Again, I used this image in our um, last presentation, but I just think it's such an important idea, this idea of finding small openings, right? You don't have to do it all at once. Um, there is a lot of opportunity for richness to come out of um, unexpected and small places. So just to throw a bunch of examples at you, like I said, um, so starting small, going slow, maybe it's just looking at the actual materials you use, collecting things from around your area. Maybe it's entering into a local contest um, that's bringing together youth on a certain topic. Um, maybe it's including videos and pictures of your local place um, to help kids get excited about their learning. So it's not just a generic picture in the textbook, but some place that they might recognize and remember, especially in small communities. This can be super fun because the kids will get so excited. Oh my gosh, I know that. that you know, that's the, that's the restaurant that we all go to on Saturdays or whatever it might be. And everybody gets really excited about that. Other things you might be thinking of is the models and examples you use um, to help students grasp an actual skill or idea that you're trying to teach. So maybe again, you're presenting them with pictures of a local place that one with the seagull is my local place. And maybe I'm talking about erosion. Maybe I'm talking about ecological systems. Um, but a lot of people who live here would go, hey, I know that. They might even say, I know that piece of wood. Um, maybe it's you know using examples of things found in nature in your local environment so that students might encounter that again. Um, maybe it's choosing books that help students connect with an actual place. And it, what's especially exciting is when you can find a book that helps students to connect with your actual place. So I didn't do too much research, but I did find this great book, I don't know if it's actually great, called S is for Sunflower, a Kansas alphabet. Um, and it, I, I, to be honest, would need to learn a lot more about Kansas to say if it is accurate. Um, but it did seem like they have one for pretty much every uh, state. And it seems like it would be a fun thing to incorporate into teaching and learning. Um, staying in that start small and go slow, you know, what can you actually do, right? Just getting kids outside, getting them engaged in learning. Um, that one in the bottom of the kids crawling, right? They're doing animal games. So maybe it's having students play games just with their body that is helping them connect to the local animals. So it doesn't matter if you know what the animals are. It could be the blue bird, the red bird, that yellow bird. Um, it could be Maybe the kids know a lot. I know sometimes in, in rural communities, I used to live in way rural Vermont, the kids knew more about the plants and animals than I often did as their teacher. Um, and they might have a better, a really good idea of how those animals move and what they eat. Um, so playing games and just actively engaging can be a fun way to start small and go slow. Um, I don't think we'll have time for practice because I think I'm, I got too excited and I'm going to run a little behind. But this is one of my favorite um, things I've done with students to get them really engaged in place. This is actually through math. Um, so going out and finding geometry in nature. Again, it's a small thing, um, but it's a fun way to connect both with nature and with place um, while also practicing, you know, their ability to identify different ideas in, in math. Um, and obviously this is, you know, we're talking about kind of science teaching, but I'm giving you a lot of uh, interdisciplinary examples because that's a lot of times what often ends up happening within, uh, within place-based education. Cool, so any questions on that part? Cool. So, what was the activity with the sticks and the, the leaves and stuff? Like, what did you do for that? Is that yours? Yeah, so that's one I've actually, um, I've done variations on this. I've had teachers do this. Um, that, 
one of them in particular, these are, these are just two images I kind of generically pulled off, but one that I've done with students was actually doing um, self-portraits using natural objects. Um, a friend of mine recently had students creating visual um, explanations of a scientific concept using natural found objects, which was just a very fun way instead of, um, you know, it takes more time, right? Maybe it's a little bit slow and clunky, but it was a great way for students to have to think more deeply about what is this, you know, what did happen in this lab and how can I explain it by not just being able to verbalize it or draw it, but to have to find things. Um, it's also in this, you know, in this virtual world, being able to set, or, or if you're teaching in person, being able to send kids outside where there's lots of space and they can move their bodies is also a great way to just, you know, do something different where they might remember it differently, right? Of trying to, I don't know, describe how erosion happens, but through sticks and stones picture drawing instead of just saying what happens. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to just use natural objects though. Um, especially if you're thinking in the interdisciplinary way, like counting, colors, all sorts of stuff. All right, so some more examples. If you're just trying to find that sort of middle ground, this might be assessments. I used this picture last time as well, right, of saying, I'm going to show a local picture and have students apply that content knowledge to it so that they're making the connection saying, oh, the water cycle happens in real life, not just in my textbook. And it can be seen in this place that I walk past every day. Um, so I think that that can be a really great way to incorporate it. Um, I wonder if your professor recognizes himself in this picture, in either of these pictures. Um, but another place is through of finding middle ground is like those special projects. So it might not be stuff that happens every single day, um, but it's a special class or it's a special field trip or maybe like the picture of these students working together. They were collecting um, data around water quality. So they're actually using real field work um, to uh, play into their science studies around the quality of the local river, um, but they were doing a lot of vertebrate Ident invertebrate identification and counts and um, recording. So practicing real important science skills, but also um, doing it through field work and really getting to know their local place. Another way is just exploring place. This could be if you're teaching virtually, right? The virtual background, it could be creating field studies opportunities. Um, it could be creating virtual visits. Um, so we'll just play this one real quick if it loads. Like this is just a very brief video I made at a local park in Chicago that is a fun way to say, hey, let's go on a trip, um, even if you can't actually go on a trip. Um, so I like that. And then I also found this really fun website. I'm, I won't click on it now so we don't get distracted, but it's actually astronauts reading stories in space, which I feel like is a very fun way on place, especially if you're trying to include the bigger universe in our concept of place and seeing ourselves as part of um, the bigger place. And then finally, kind of that on that furthest end of the spectrum, that whole idea of teaching with the earth in mind. This is really where you're looking at developing whole projects to connect standards, the local genius, the student interest and community action. Now, this takes a ton of time and is not something that I would recommend doing, you know, saying to yourself on a, on a Saturday evening, yes, I want to start that on a Monday. Most often project development, especially with a place-based focus will take quite a while. It's important also to be working um, with the local community and people who can help you um, sort that out. So um, I've done a lot of place-based teaching, especially around gardening and develop gard developing gardens, um, as well as around field studies. I have a friend who has created an entire curriculum around the Colombian exchange and really helping students to make those big connections across big place 
uh, spans um, through food that the students actually grow. So a different sense of place. Um, and then of course, we talked last week about na using nature journals um, as a way to connect with place kind of on a daily or weekly basis where you're doing deep in-depth studies um, and really connecting uh, your data collection to something that's maybe more artful or more useful of long-term observation. Um, and then of course there's the, the most complicated, I would say, it's super fun, I've done a bit of this, but it takes a lot of time, is creating those local community partnerships to support your teaching and learning. So um, this is a group I used to work with, those are actually two of my students from, oh my gosh, my first year of teaching, um, where the, um, we were actually working with a local group to do trail building and trail maintenance um, specifically related to water runoff while we were studying soils and soil ecology um, in our seventh grade science class. It took a ton of time, it was really hard, and as a first year teacher it was not the smartest decision, um, but it ended up being fun and was a partnership that I developed over time um, with a lot more success in the second and third years. So. Um, there you go. That's a ton of examples. I'm not going to read this through. I just put this slide in here so you could check it out later, but it's really three easy ways to get started with PBE. Um, the most basic one is just go explore. Walk around your local neighborhood. Um, pay attention. Um, you can do some research. So Googling is a great way. Just what can you learn about your, your neighborhood or your community that you didn't know before? Um, and then, of course, connecting. So like actually talking to people. Uh, which can be intimidating, but also can be a wealth of knowledge. Um, I've been doing that a lot around the place where I live, especially when I learned that somebody's lived here for 40 years and just talking with them about everything from how the climate has changed or the community has changed. Um, and it's really exciting to see um, stuff that I would never know because I'm not old enough to know that. Um, so I'll let you read through these. I've also included a link to a really cool app um, if you want to learn more about the indigenous peoples who live or have lived in the places um, where you may be teaching, um, which can spark a whole other um, wealth of, of curiosity. So there you go. Phew, that was uh, the, the fastest I could, I think I could go through um, an introduction to place-based education. Are there any questions or comments or things that I can touch on before we wrap up? I think one thing I'll throw in is, um, I guess a couple. One, never like underestimate how little kids or adults may know about the place they live, even if they've lived there for a long time. One of the ones that has fascinated me um, being in Western Kansas, especially kind of towards the Southwest part of it, is the number of people I've heard be like, oh, where can you see a pronghorn? And like, here, like literally here, like they live here. Um, and there, there's people who are like, th there are, I am sure there are more students here that know what a giraffe looks like than a pronghorn, um, which is a little bit weird to me because you're like, one of those is on the other side of the earth, but like every kid can sketch a giraffe. And like, what's a pronghorn look like? I don't know. Um, I didn't know that was a thing. So that's one that like, it always amazes me like, oh, they don't know that, they've grown up here. They don't, um, or a lot of them don't. The um, other one is as you're working on your lesson plans, whether it's your place-based one or like your earth systems one or stuff, when you get stuck, I think a great strategy is just like, just go outside for a little bit. Um, Cause like when you're stuck, if you just like sit mm -hmm. there still being stuck, you're gonna think like all sorts of unkind things about me and like, that jerk, he doesn't know what it's like, whatever. Um, and you're like, you'll still be stuck. And like, I know you think those things because I thought those things about um, professors I had. Um, but even just taking like a little break to like get out and, you know, just stuff like sticks out to you or, you know, little things like, oh, I wonder. Um, so that's when I've started um, in the mornings, I drop my kids off at school. Um, it's usually chaotic. There's always like, We've, we've had a lot of toothpaste related incidents um, where like um, yesterday my kindergartner had it on his forehead and his shirt. And so like this morning, you're like brush your teeth shirtless um, so you don't go to school with toothpaste all over your shirt, get him to school. 
like toothpaste all over his shorts. Like, awesome. Um, anyway, I started like, I dropped him off and then there's a few just fields that I go by and um, I have binoculars and I just kind of look him over for five or 10 minutes um, and just get outside for a little bit, you know, or maybe walk along the road um, on the edge of them some. And it's just kind of like a great way to kind of clear your head, also get some different perspective. Um, I think anything you're working on, if you're stuck, don't sit there being stuck. Like go read something or get outside or whatever. But like I've never been stuck and just like suddenly become unstuck sitting there. Um, I've become really angry sitting there, but not unstuck. Mm -hmm. um, or ask questions. That's the other one if you're just like, that's it. I'm never going to become a teacher. This is all a lost cause. Um, ask questions, even if you um, figure out the answer on your own later. Um, you know, kind of keep that in mind because I think we're getting to the part of the semester where it's getting busier. It's getting a bit more chaotic. Um, life is just kind of like catching up. Um, so those are things I would keep in mind. Um, and especially with place based, just like go outside where you are and like look around and be like, what could I use here? Mm -hmm. um, and it always fascinates me, even like little details of things that, um, like even in my yard, just like daily changes, uh, we have a squirrel that's kind of like moved in on our windowsill and starts looking in our kitchen now. Um, and it's when we were just like, um, because my kids were like, it, it was carrying some sort of nut and they're like, oh, it's carrying a walnut. I'm like, well, it's not carrying a walnut because there's not a walnut tree around. Like, I don't really know what he's carrying, um, but it's obviously something. And so you get an idea like that, of like, well, what do squirrels here eat, um, you know, in a mostly prairie with just a few trees? And um, so anyway, that's some kind of suggestions as you're working through this. Uh, and also, I think it's important to start from a place of saying where I am is valuable. Mm -hmm. um, you'll get in communities where the kids don't like all they want is to get out. They're just like, I want to be out of here. I want to be out of here. Um, you know, they'll be back in 10 years. But it's not super helpful to like say that. And so I think there's a lot of value in showing them what's there. Um, or maybe even helping them like rethink what's there. Um, there's an idea in place-based education called the genius of place. And every place has a genius. Um, and by that, I don't mean just the particular people, but it's all the aspects that you could possibly list of a place. It's the businesses that are there. It's the businesses that were there. It's like where I live currently was almost entirely destroyed by the steel mills, but then was also completely restored in partnership with the steel mills um, ecologically. And that is a really big part of things that people look down on this region because they're like, oh, it's just... That's like Gary, Indiana, and it's all steel mills, and it's just a bunch of junk, and we just drive past that when we're going to better places. Um, and yet, it's one of the most biodiverse places in, the, in our country because of the ecological restoration and care, um, which I would consider part of the genius of people saying, oh, whoa, wait, 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 we love this place. It's important. It's necessary. Um, it's a place to be valued. So, yeah, I would definitely... Both, both what Dr. Clay said of getting outside, right? Just, just getting outside and looking around, but also finding those points where you can say, how can I help my students see the value and the genius of this place? Um, so one, I guess, one last thing I'll throw in with that. Um, your place-based lesson plans can be for wherever, so I, um, you know, if you're like, oh, I'm going to probably still be here when I teach. Cool. If you're like, I'm definitely don't want to be here, the Denver airport. Um, you know, if you're like, no, I want to be in this community. Also, because I think when you go to apply for jobs, if you're like, no, I really want to be in the Kansas City area and I've made this great place-based lesson for the Kansas City area, I think that's kind of a cool thing to show off. Be like, um, that's honestly one of the things that I think helped me get this job was that I, I'm a Western Kansas person and wanted to be a Western Kansas person, not just like, um, oh, I'm willing to live there. 
like, no, I actually want to. And then I'm kind of like, are you sure? I'm like, yes, I'm sure. Um, so you can kind of keep that in mind. Whatever place it is that you want to pick, mm -hmm. that's up to you. Um, and the more meaningful it is, the better. Um, in Kansas, and I think probably most of the West, uh, every county um, has an extension office with, um, they're a great resource. They're, um, I don't think people call them very often. So they're always excited when you're like, hey, I want to teach about this thing around here. They'll give you a ton of resources. Local landowners, mm -hmm. for the most part, are wonderful about, hey, I want to get kids outside. Um, it's a great way because like they feel like they're really contributing to the school and they are, and it doesn't cost them anything. Um, so I was amazed a couple years ago when we developed a, an environmental science class, the number of local landowners that are like, sure, you can come out on my place. And some of them are even like out there to greet us and show us around. And um, so local landowners, if you're just like, hey, can I um, bring some students out here? Or can you tell me about um, this? Mm -hmm. So that might be a resource you can look into if you're kind of stuck is um, just talk to some people that have been around there for a while, um, especially ranchers. Ranchers know places. Um, I mean, they have to or they're not ranchers very long. So, you know, those can be good folks to talk to because they, they know what's going on. Um, and they're usually pretty open to sharing, especially if you're approaching it from a, hey, I want you to share because I want kids to be able to see this. So... Anyway, do either of you have a last minute question? Um, awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Brettel, for sharing. Morgan, I hope you have a safe trip. Um, where did you say you're going? Um, I'm going to Salt Lake to see my boyfriend. So Denver to Salt Lake. Yeah, I flew from like, out of Denver. Yeah, so you probably like, by the time you would get to take your seatbelt off, they'll tell you to put it back on. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but well, I had to also remember that the time change was different. So I was like, "Oh, it's like right now. Class is right now," because <laughs> I was I'm, like, "Oh, it's ten thirty. I'm good." I'm impressed because I've messed up a lot of those in my life. <laughs> yeah. uh, and in fact, Dr. Brettel, when we like first started working on projects together, you were in Dubai at that point, right? Or Mumbai? Is Mumbai was it India? Yeah. 11 and a half hour time difference. Wasn't it 11 and a half? Yeah, it, yes, awkward. It was the awkward half. Yeah, so good job on figuring out time zones because I haven't yet. But have a safe trip. Thank you. I'm about to board, so gotta go. Right. Have fun. Thanks. Bye. All right, cool. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing it.